say amen for our teacher as she comes. Amen. Looking so lovely. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Put this down there with you so that that's yours. Hey, y'all. Hey. hey, man. Good to be here and uh, so grateful uh, to God for all of his goodness. As Pastor Bland was praying, you know, I, I absolutely thank God for conditions being as well as they are. And, you know, as we are studying in the Gospels, that's a lot of, of, of what Jesus talked to those that followed him about, you know, uh, things that would help them to live at that time. And um, when we ended last Sunday, we were over in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So we're going to go ahead and start there. We had talked about several of the things that he preached about. We talked about the money rule and then the golden rule. This morning we'll start with the judgment rule. So let's go to Matthew 7. Let's look at Matthew 7. So as we're going to Matthew 7, talk to me a little bit about judgment and why we judge the way that we do. What do y'all think about that? And you, know, you know what judgment is, don't you? You give an opinion uh, about something. Sometimes you give an opinion about something you don't even know about. <laughs> I see a hand back there. Okay. 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 Do Do you also think when we are judging that um, we judge them by we judge them because of who we are? Do you think that has something to do with our judgment? I have a question. Okay. Okay. And the question as is... As you are asking your question, can you go and stand up and close that door back there? Okay, Curtis got it. Okay. okay. The question I have is, evidently, we, we are saying that judgment is negative. We're speaking of negative sense, not in, the positive. In a negative sense, yes. Uh, is it negative toward the person who does the judging or the person who receives judging? Uh, it does. It does the person who receives it no good, other than if if they if they, <laughs> unless they internalize it, you know. Uh, but um, what, what what Jesus says here is, "Judge not that ye be not judged. For what, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again." Um, and in the sense that Sister Tara was talking about, he goes on to say, And why beholdest thou the mote, or the little stick, or the little twig, that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam, the big log, that is in thine own eye? That lets you know right there that you can't judge uh, in, a, in a perfect sense. Well, when, when I read something, and for some reason, these are not, it doesn't sound as loud or something. Turn up just a little bit. Okay, that's, that's better. Um, when I read, I have to remember where I'm reading. Right, And this right. is up under the law. Right, and right. And this is Jesus talking to uh, Israel under the law. Right. So none of them can judge because all of them are guilty. Mm -hmm. It's like the pot calling the kettle black. Mm-hmm. But now the scripture says over when it, with believers, they said that um, the, the, uh, the saints are even going to judge the angels. So I don't think in a sense this really applies to the believer in the fact that uh, it's not really him anymore. It's the spirit of God. And so if the spirit of Christ is in you, then the spirit, and, and it's in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, when it says that, uh, you, you are able to discern. Uh, before a person has the spirit of God, it's certain things they don't know. They don't know the things of God. But according to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, once that um, the spirit, uh, you have the spirit of Christ, and you are, you are able to judge. 
And so I think that's been a conflict throughout the years, and that's something that a person will say in a hurry, uh, judge not that you be not judged. And you're taking a scripture out of context. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it's the difference between law and grace. Go okay. ahead. Let's just talk about it in an everyday sense is what we're really actually talking about that we do, uh, <laughs> that we judge. Uh, and I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. So thank you for that, Pastor Bland. So uh, even in an everyday sense, we have a tendency to do so. We just have a tendency to do so. So uh, as, as he talked and as he, he ministered to those who were around him, then he also did several things, as I said, to help them with their circumstances. Um, let's look at math. Go ahead, Pastor. Pastor oh, I, I was. I just found the scripture. First mm -hmm. Corinthians two and fifteen. Okay, y'all want to go there? Now we've all heard Matthew seven, which talks about judge not that you mm -hmm. be not judged, and but First Corinthians two and fifteen. The Bible says, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet mm -hmm. he himself is judge of no man. Uh, and you don't ever hear them say that. True. So uh, that's, that's all. I Where just want to show First uh, Corinthians 2 and 15. Oh, okay. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay. And so then the believer has... Because people have said that after a person, first thing a person hears after they get saved is, and you're around people that you, you can't judge. The Bible said, judge not that you be not judged. And uh, you're just picking the parts of scripture that you want. But I, I understand what you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. In Matthew 6, the worry rule. Matthew 6, let's look at Matthew 6 and 31. Therefore, let me let you get there. Matthew 6 and 31. Just some things that he talked about and ministered about. Some things that would help them to make it through uh, that time, the crucial times that they were in. Matthew 6 and 31. Says that, therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. And so, uh, uh, Again, we know, as Pastor Bland said, that, that who he's preaching to and at the time that he's preaching. Uh, so then uh, what we're told is to be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in all the things that you have need of, then you make your prayers and your requests, your supplications known to God. And God, who is ever present, is always ready to meet your needs. And, and when we talk about uh, meeting our needs, what I, and what I found out, especially in this pandemic, Sister Tara, is that I don't need all the things that I thought I needed. And it has just helped me to that. It has helped me to understand that a lot better than I did before this occurred. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, that I'll be able to stay with that because uh, we live in a world of access, excess, excess, excess. And I'm talking to myself now, even in the pandemic, even in the pandemic, Pastor Bland told y'all last Sunday, I got a package coming every week. But, y'all, I don't need all the stuff that I thought I needed. And, um, you know... What sense is it? And the more stuff you get, I believe, Pastor Bland, the more stuff you had to worry about. That's true. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it, it helps you to help yourself when you can detach yourself 
from a lot of things and detach yourself. Come on, somebody, from a lot of people. Then the pandemic teach you you didn't need to have to be, you didn't have to be around all the people you thought you had to be around. I thank God for that. I thank God for that. You know, uh, sometimes it doesn't feel good. We get a little lonely and, you know, uh, we feel a little isolated because we're not able to do and go be and be all the places and around all the people that we were. But this has been a time, this has been a time truly for us to grow in a whole lot of ways, uh, for us to see things a lot differently. And so um, I, I, I thank God for that. And then uh, let's look over at Matthew 7, where we are. We're already in Matthew 7. He talked to them about this and said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receive, and he that seeketh find, and to him that knock it shall be open. So, um, Jesus was talking to a lot of people with different types of needs and different levels of belief. And we know the reason they flocked to him. And as we go on, we will we'll see that. Uh, it, let's go to Matthew 8, that, that he never had to seek for a crowd. Never had to seek for a crowd, Pastor Blaine, because they were going to follow him because of. Some of them will follow him because they, 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 they heard the words that fell from his lips and they were intrigued by it. But that wasn't the majority of them. The majority of them followed him because his fame had spread abroad. And why had his fame spread abroad? Because of the things that he was doing. Because of the things that he was doing. And so he was performing miracles. Those, those were miracles. It was a miracle, certainly. And certainly, if you have, you know, sick family members or if you're sick yourself and there's somebody there that can lay hands on them or speak a word and it be done, you're going to follow them or try to find them. And so he didn't have any trouble trying to get a crowd because of that. Uh, and, and, and if you really look at it, he, he really tried to avoid the crowd, which is so different from what it is today. Today... Uh, they tried to draw a crowd, to draw a crowd, and, and, and they do that for different reasons, because of uh, ego a lot of times, because it's uh, mercenary, they, because of the, you know, of the money that comes with a crowd sometimes. Sometimes you have a crowd and it's not money in it, but that's usually the reason. And so uh, we know that many times after he healed somebody, he told him, you know, don't, don't tell anybody about it. You just go on about your way and be happy that you healed and go on about it. So we know that because when you think about it, he didn't want people trusting him simply on the basis of what he was doing. But because of the makeup of people and because of what was occurring then, uh, uh, we know that that wasn't how it was, and that's not really how it is now. But we know that when you talk about Jesus and you talk about belief and you talk about what he was doing, that uh, not to look at what he was doing, you want, he wanted uh, people to exercise faith. And we have come to know faith as what? Taking him at his word taking him at his word, that you don't have to have to see a miracle in order to believe who he is and to believe his ability. So then we come to, um, we come to this story. And before we do, we're still in, well, we're in Matthew 7. Uh, let's go over to uh, Luke, the seventh chapter. This is a great story about uh, love and a story about compassion. I 
Okay, so I'll ask the question. What does having compassion mean to you? What does having compassion mean to you? Compassion. It's, it's the opposite of what we've seen the last four years from, from President Trump and from obviously half of the nation. Uh, you, you kind of on compassion, um, let me just let me just put it on the negative side. What is it? What is it? Uncompassionate? In no. In incompassionate. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that would be people who you judge according to what you, you know what I mean. Um, I just I went and got some gas this morning, and I, I was looking at some people, and it appeared, you know, I'm so into myself that I start that I don't really value all that God have done for me. There's some people that's living a whole lot worse than I am. But I can't see that because I'm just thinking about me all the time. And um, you're not compassionate. You just think about yourself. That's, I guess that's best like a blanket umbrella definition for me, Deborah. It's just when, when you're just thinking about yourself. But when you look upon other people, and just like me with my knees now, you had, you say, <laughs> <laughs> you said you had problems years ago, but I didn't have no compassion on you because it wasn't me. And so, you know, Robert told me his hip going bad this morning, but <laughs> my hip feel all right. And so compassion is just thinking about somebody up beside yourself. Okay. And sometimes, let me just finish with saying this. Um, I have to, even in raising children, you know what I mean? Because I have such high expectations of my children. And sometimes I don't put myself in their shoes. I just be, I'm looking at what I want out of them. That's, that, that's good. Anybody else? Anybody else? What, what does compassion, having compassion mean to you? Uh, and if if it's ever was a time for us to be compassionate, or, you know, it is now. I know it's, it's funny how um, we want we want people to be compassionate to us, uh, but then we withhold compassion when it comes to someone else. And it's easy to do. You do it without thinking, because we're basically selfish. And so that's what um, I love to read when Jesus moved among the people because in his moving among the people, the Bible often says that he was moved with compassion. There's no way that you can be around people, in my estimation, there's no way that you can be around people who have various and sundry needs and not be moved uh, with compassion. Lady like Deborah, I know when um, that policeman put his knee on George Floyd's neck for that extended period of time, I was amazed at how that most white people couldn't see it like I saw it. To me, it was just like another human being. How could you do a human? You can't. You can't understand how that feel. You know, and I, I don't know. But but turn it right around, but t t do the flip side of it. There were so many, so many people of different colors who came out and 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 voiced uh, their disdain and voiced how and, and and came and 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 it, and and showed compassion because they had never never realized what we as a people were going through. And when that was like displayed for all the world to see, you had to be a cold somebody to turn your head to what was going on. 
And so a lot of people, they, they, they had compassion like they had never experienced before. And so that movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, it, it, had, it, it, it uh, gained a lot of allies during that time. And, and that would make me angry when people say Black Lives Matter and then it's all lives matter. Ho, ho, oh, we. <laughs> It make me angry. I understand. I understand. And so uh, compassion then has been defined as your pain, which you're going through, in my heart. Your pain in my heart. I, you know, you just, oh, my God. You can't never really say, like, I've had, during this time, we talk about the pandemic because it just is, it's just a lot. It's just a lot that has happened, a lot that we've experienced within uh, this pandemic and what's going on. It's just a lot. I, as I said last Sunday, I've been in uh, contact, but I've never seen as much loss loss of family members, but uh, I've had uh, acquaintances that lost spouses. I don't know what that's like, because I still have mine. But, oh, and so then my heart goes out. Oh my God, I can feel the pain. I don't know, I've been married to a Pastor Bland for over 40 years, and to lose him uh, would be devastating. So then when I, when, when I see and hear other people going through that type of loss, that pain is in my heart. It's in my heart. Because oh, I, I just can't even imagine how that must feel. Or a child. I can't even imagine how that must feel. Now, uh, if someone says, you know, they lost a sibling, I know how that feels. Amen. I know how that feels. I know how it feels to lose a father. Because I've had to, you know, I'm sending cards to people and I'm saying, oh my God, when I heard about your father, it, 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 it hurt me because I'm a daddy's girl. And so I, it, I know how it hurt me. I don't know what you're feeling exactly, but I know how it hurt me. So I know you must be going through. So compassion, when Jesus was moved with compassion, that's saying something. He had a lot of compassion and enough to go around. And this particular story is one of a centurion servant where let, um, Pastor Let, let me say this on mm -hmm. And, you know, the assembly that we, you know, we call the church. But the assemblies that we gather in, that has been my uh, uh, experience. One thing that was so great about going to New Calvary was is that I felt the compassion. I felt the compassion to a, better, to a better degree than I had in other places. You see, people can't be compassionate for, with you when they're jealous of you. It's when they're jealous of And that's, you know, jealousy is something else, man, you know, because they don't merely, they, they can't help it. A person, a person has to work on not being jealous. When the jealousy comes in your heart, then you have to apply spiritual principles to it to get that, because it ain't right. It's not right for you to begrudge person being fortunate. And if you, if you got something, you're just fortunate. Because you can make all kind of plans to be in this position, to have this and whatever and everything, and your little plans will just fall down. And so if you have a little money in the bank, if your family is doing well, if you are able to buy nicer clothes, it's because you're fortunate. Yeah. It ain't because you... Yeah. And, and, and then... Uh, People don't understand where you came from. And you finally now got a little something. And then the people that you go to church with begrudge you. And, you know, you can tell. You can tell. I used to try to buy folks to keep them from being jealous. And, it, and that don't work. You know, Thanksgiving coming around because I had a little money and stuff like that. Everybody that don't have nothing, or don't have nothing, I'm just buying turkeys and whatever. They eat my turkeys, didn't talk about me. And so it's just fortunate. I'm just kind of putting that spin on it. It's fortunate to be a part of an assembly where that people can have compassion, mm -hmm. compassion mm -hmm. on you. It hurts me sometimes when, like, somebody in the assembly has somebody that passed, and maybe because this person is not as well known or not as popular, then you don't do for them or you don't 
see about them the way you do for maybe one of the stars of the assembly. That, 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 that hurts me. It does. I can say for Manasseh, I've seen, and I, it makes me feel so good when I hear that, okay, this person uh, had some clothes from a baby or something, and they brought them over to the people's house and, and gave it to them. I, I can say that from what I've seen over the years, that there is a lot of compassion in this place. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. If you were talking, I don't know, for some reason, I, start, I was thinking about also how if you were just an extreme narcissist, you cannot, you cannot have compassion for anybody. And that made me think about, again, the person that's in the White House right now who's about to exit the White House. And that's why, you know, the pandemic is going on. It's still going. You don't know. It hadn't left. People are still dying. The number of people dying has increased daily. And all he can think about is how he going to exit. If he going to have a 21-gun salute when he leaves. And the people take it, take, you know, so uh, to me, it's really all, a lot of that is a distraction about what's really going on. We still have loved ones. We got somebody in this assembly in the hospital right now. You know, it's, 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 you cannot. So, you know, compassion. And Lady Deborah, the thing about it is, if you got compassion, it'll make your life better. It will. If all will. you sit around and do is think about yourself, I guarantee you're going to be miserable. It will. Because compassion will move you to, it will actually move you to do something for someone else. It will, it will actually move you to do something. And there's no better feeling than when you are actually going through and you might be going through it not to say that you you're, you're not cuz you may be going through yourself but then when you're moved with compassion by somebody else and their issues and their problems it moves you to try to do something for them and then also it helps you with the next time you going through cuz you will go through again then you know isn't going through is just not a one and done so the next time you go through it, it'll help you to go through in a different way. Well, somebody will care about you. Yes. Yes. It, it makes me think about it. I don't know what it was. I think it might have been your daddy's brother, Applehead, or somebody, that they had a funeral, and it was raining. And I think maybe one person walked out there to the wedding. You know how they go to the grave side and mm -hmm, got ready to do it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe one person. And I thought to myself, I said, He'll live such a selfish life, won't nobody even get their feet dirty. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's just how it is. If you don't care nothing about nobody else, you don't do it. When your time come, people go, I don't know. Yeah. He never done nothing for nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So in uh, Luke chapter 7, it says, now when he had ended all his sayings, I'm in uh, verse 1. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. See, that, so they liked this centurion, even though he was Roman, a Roman soldier. They liked him. Okay? And so the, the centurion then had compassion on his servant. He liked, he loved his servant and wanted him to be healed. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly. In verse 5, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou should entereth uh, under my entereth that thou shouldest enter. <laughs> I don't know where I got that from, under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. And so then when we look at the soldier, we look at the great love that he had for his servant, which is very impressive. 
That's impressive that he had that much love for him, that he would send to Jesus, that he sought Jesus on behalf of the servant. And then you look at his humility. Now, Pastor Bland, that's something that you just got to have. That's, and, and, and you've said it so often and it's so very clear that's the only way that grace can come in is when you are humble and when you show humility. Otherwise, God resists the proud. But the only way you can get grace is when you lower that. Uh, he gives grace. He gives grace. He gives grace to the humble. And so this man's humility is also impressive because he says, for in verse 8, for I also am a man set under authority, having one under me, soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. He marveled at him. So then this was the most impressive thing. The love was impressive. The humility was impressive. But the most impressive was the faith that this man, a Gentile, uh, 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 this man who uh, had a pagan background, this man who uh, was trained to be self-sufficient, Jesus marveled at the faith that he displayed uh, because he had throngs of people following him who had not displayed, who were Jews, who had not displayed this type of faith. And so Jesus marveled at this man. And so he said, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. And so you talk about faith and we talk about uh, being a believer. Uh, when, 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 when the centurion looked at, uh, at, at the whole uh, situation, he says, I'm a man under authority. Then I got somebody over me. They tell me what to do. I got people under me. Uh, and I tell them what to do. And then he looked at the way Jesus commanded uh, the diseases and everything. You know, I know you, all you got to do is say a word. All you got to do is say a word because we are the type of you, you. When I say something, things happen. When you say something, things happen. It's, 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 it's like that. And so that's, that's, that's faith. And as, as believers, we talk about being believers. You can't be a believer without exercising faith. Cornerstone of the Christian religion. Faith. Faith. Taking God at his word. Not anything extra. Uh, not, not saying, Lord, if, if you, if you do this, I'll serve you. Not saying, Lord, if you can, but believing him and taking him at his word. It sounds so, so simple, but sometimes it's so hard for us to do because we want to put, uh, we want to put uh, extra things on it. We want to just, we want to make it, we want to make it hard. We want to make it hard when it really is simple. Uh, but as we go on, then he goes to Nain, which is about uh, Nain, which is about 25 miles from Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum, he meets a funeral procession. Let's look at that. And it came to pass the day after. I'm in verse 11, chap Luke chapter 7, verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now, when he came not to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. We're talking about compassion. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. He had compassion on her. As you think about a woman who is a widow, uh, a woman who, who has lost the provider for the home. That's enough to, for you to have compassion on somebody right there. Lost the provider. Now uh, you have a son who could, who could help to provide, and now he's dead. Who wouldn't be moved with compassion? Well, 
That's probably the wrong question. But Jesus understood this. And you're living in a, in a society at that time, there wasn't a lot of provisions made for widows. And so Jesus is knowing, oh my God, she needs some help. She needs help. He, she needs somebody there that will be able to help her. And so he says, weep not. And he came and touched the bier. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead set up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And so um, Jesus just spoke the word again, and the boy was raised to life and health. He sat up and spoke, evidence that he had life in him. And so the response of the people, and uh, it says here, and there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about him. And, <clears throat> and so now we go to, um, we're still in Luke 7. Let's go over to verse 41. So now Jesus is in the home of a Pharisee. And uh, what, what is it that we know about the Pharisees? That, that they, did, well, we can say that there are some that didn't have a lot of compassion. You know, they, they, and, they, and they had a lot of judgment. They, they did not have a lot of compassion. So um, let's see. Let's start at verse 36. I'm sorry. Are you there? And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. When she saw that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood as his and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bitten him saw it, he spake within himself, he's thinking, saying, this man if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus, knowing his thoughts, Jesus answering, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. And so, uh, we, we know this story. Uh, Simon was condemning him in his thoughts. This is a lot of times, you know, condemning him in his thoughts for allowing her, this type of woman, to come in. First of all, to get close enough to him to anoint him with anything. But not, not only did she anoint him with what was in her alabaster box, but she cried and she, she, she washed his feet with her tears, took her hair and then dried his feet. Uh, and so he condemned them in his thoughts for allowing such actions. And so then Jesus gives a parable. And we know that Jesus often taught parables, parables simply a simple story with a deeper meaning. That look beyond that, a simple story with a deeper meaning. And so he said there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? So then if I got, you know, if I, I owe... Ten years worth of, uh, worth of debt, 
and you only owe 10 months worth of debt, who's going who's gonna to like be the happiest? <laughs> Are they both happy? They're both happy just because he's, they're, they're forgiven. I mean, but Lord Jesus, if I, if I owe 10 years worth and I was forgiven, I would be turning cartwheels. I would, you know what I'm saying? And so Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said to him, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, see if thou this woman look. I came into your house, Simon. You asked me to come. I came into your house. I, uh, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head, with oil, thou did not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Mm. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And so, uh, you know, another extreme case of compassion and judgment. Simon had given him no welcome, uh, no kiss of welcome, but she kissed his feet, and Simon had not anointed him uh, with oil, but she uh, continued to anoint him, continued to kiss his feet. And so these are just, just lessons that, that Jesus taught them, lessons that Jesus taught them to help them in their everyday life. And he said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Again, we're talking about faith and we're talking about uh, how important it is in the life of a believer. How important it is in the life of a believer. So we're going to stop here and we're going to pick up uh, next Sunday uh, with um, the second tour that he had as he was going around Galilee. And we'll start in Mark, the third chapter. So give the Lord a hand. Praise everybody. <laughs>